evening. Thank you for joining us for today's Community Telephone Town Hall. My name is Zoelle Stackhouse and I'm the Special Assistant to the Deputy Chief of Staff of Mayor Muriel Bowser. Today we are joined again by the Chancellor of DC Public Schools, Dr. Lewis Faraby, who will be providing an update on the Term 3 reopening of DC Public Schools. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that if you would like to ask a question at any time during the call, you can press zero and you'll be added into our speaker queue. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Lewis Faraby. Good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us for this evening discussion on term three for DC Public Schools. I am joined by members of our teaching and learning team this evening to share some of the highlights of the way that DCPS is thinking about our path forward for term three and term four and our instructional strategy specifically for this school year. It's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight some presenters that you have opportunity to hear from and that is our chief, Corey Cogan. We also have deputy chiefs on our teaching and learning team which includes Allison Williams and Karen Cole. Tonight again, they will highlight some of the features of the way that we're supporting our teachers and also how we are supporting our students. As we think about term three and term four, it's important to highlight where we are in our implementation of our instructional strategies and where students are receiving their instruction. So we have approximately 10,000 students that are learning in person, either in our IPL classroom or in our care model. And then we have the other 40,000 students in the districts that are continuing to learn remotely. We are planning for schools to expand their in-person learning opportunities for term four, which begins in April after spring break on April 19th. Uh, those schools, especially that have uh, capacity challenges and have demand for more in-person activity, are now beginning to craft plans for expanding their services. Uh, we will finalize those plans in March, and then we will communicate to families any seats that are available going into term four. We also have those schools that are not yet at capacity for term three. Uh, they will maintain their classrooms for the foreseeable future and continue to make offers to those families uh, that are in those grade levels or schools that still have seats remaining. It's also important to note that we continue to think about how we can get better and improve our service delivery for both those students that are in person and also those students that are learning remotely. It's also important to note that our default planning for the upcoming 21-22 school year remains in-person learning for all of our students. And we're beginning to support schools in their development of their summer plans and plans for acceleration for the 21-22 school year. So it's my pleasure at this time to turn it over to Corey Cogan, who's gonna share a little bit more about our learning models and the way that we're thinking about instruction for the weeks and months ahead. Corey, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. We're really happy to be here tonight to talk a little bit more about some of the highlights and spotlights of um, in-person learning and hybrid learning um, so far in term three. So as uh, people may be familiar with, schools worked with their communities to engage them in order to develop their plans for the return to in-person learning. We had reopening community cores set up in each school community where um, school leadership teams worked with staff and parents and community members to design the learning plan that would work best for the individual characteristics for that school. Um, if you are interested to learn more about the specific plan for any particular school, all of those plans are posted on the website that you can see on the screen at this time. So it's really with great pleasure that I'm able to turn it over to some of my team members who are actually going to give us some highlights of what are some of these various plans, how do they play out in different schools, what are some spotlights of what it looks like um, in different classrooms, whether the teacher is working with one group of students in person only or is working um, with their whole classroom community, some in person and some tuning in from home. So to kick us off, I'm going to turn it over to Allison Williams to share some highlights. Thanks, Corey, um, and thank you, Chancellor, for inviting me here to share. Um, I'm really, really excited to be able to share just a couple of stories um, to highlight some really exciting activities and learning experiences that are happening in our schools, um, just to give us a, a quick 
snapshot into what learning is looking like um, in DCPS classrooms right now. So the first anecdote I would love to share um, is from a second grade classroom at Bunker Hill Elementary School. Um, one of our content managers for elementary ELA, Heather Zerbliss, was doing a classroom visit. And what she noticed was that Miss Oliver, um, as she was doing a small group literacy lesson, she actually had engaged the combined model um, of instruction. So she had a group of students in front of her for a small group lesson, and she also simultaneously had a group of students uh, virtually who were tuning in um, in a very engaging literacy um, activity. So that was, that was awesome. The kids were engaged. Um, the teacher had really planned leveraging the technology to make sure that students could be engaged in the instruction, whether they were in person or at home. Next slide. The uh, second spotlight that I am excited to share about comes from one of our early childhood classrooms um, at Tyler Elementary School. This example really is exciting to share. Uh, so at Tyler, the kiddos were learning about gardening and they had been learning, they had been planting vegetables and plants. And so on this particular day, um, the kids had a special guest. And so the teacher gave some prompts that, you know, the guest is small, it's, it's wiggly, we see them outside all the time. And one of the kids shouted out, I know, it's a wiggly, wiggly worm. And so it was really, really exciting for our little guys and girls to have a chance to have their own individual worms, to observe how the worms move, to touch them, um, and then actually some of the lettuce that they had planted to actually take a lettuce leaf and watch the worm actually engage um, with the lettuce. They learned that worms have these itty bitty tiny mouths that we cannot see um, with our eyes and that it actually took a week for the worm to actually um, eat one leaf of lettuce. Um, so that was fun and exciting. Um, I am now gonna actually pass the mic over to my colleague Karen Cole who's gonna share uh, some more context around some of the virtual learning experiences. Thank you, Allison, and good afternoon, everyone. It's our longstanding commitment to our students and families to provide a rigorous and joyful education. And our educators have used this shift to virtual learning. They were already innovative and inspiring, but they've become even more so during this virtual learning time. So on Thursday, February 25th, we held a professional development event called the Virtual Learning Conference. And that let them share their innovations and insights about virtual learning with their colleagues all across the district. Um, during this conference, educators and school leaders, they shared how they use their, all the digital tools and resources, how they check for understanding, how they track engagement, and how they stay engaged with their own professional development um, and skill sets while, they're, while we're, we're teaching and learning at home. They heard directly from students about how their vir about their virtual learning experience, um, including the challenges and the opportunities that the, their classmates and school communities have experienced. They also heard directly from families, particularly about how um, schools have communicated and engaged with them and what worked best to really keep them um, feeling in the loop about their students' education. Next slide. Virtual learning has helped us to double down on our efforts to ensure that our graduates feel prepared for life beyond DCPS. And so a parent from Ron Brown High School wrote to us to share how much her son is enjoying participating in a new DCPS math course. It's called Financial Algebra, and it teaches algebra through real world challenges related to finance. The parent was excited that her son is engaged now and also will be better prepared for the future. Next slide. DCPS has kept the arts alive in virtual learning. Um, one of the things that we've done is purchase software for every school so that in instrumental music, students can actually record their parts at home and receive feedback from their teacher and peers and showcase the whole class performance. So what you're seeing here is um, 50 students from Hardy Middle School who performed an arrangement of We Shall Overcome under the direction of their music teacher, Dr. Robert Ro Roche. And you know, art is a hands-on thing and it goes beyond the screen too. 
thanks to a, a generous donation from National Gallery of Arts, Arts Around the Corner program, DCPS has also um, distributed hands-on art supplies to um, every art teacher to make sure that they could distribute art supplies to their students at home and keep hands-on learning alive. Next slide. And it's been really exciting because virtual learning has brought some special opportunities to our high school students. Students from across the district are actually meeting in um, a high school elective course to learn about 3D animation and design. And they're led by teachers from the Hirshhorn Museum and from a, a company called Genesis Theme. The final design from this class will be an immersive virtual gallery for all of our district-wide art and music showcases. And with that, I'll turn it back to Chancellor Farabee. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Allison. And thank you, Karen, for those highlights of the work that DCPS uh, is moving forward across our district. It is exciting to see that the arts are still alive and well during this time period. We know many of our students uh, rely on the arts, uh, not only as a way to advance uh, their own studies in those content areas, but also integrating across other content areas as well. Uh, I want to remind uh, the public that we are still committed to ensuring that there is robust engagement from a diverse group of voices in our reopening plans, but also our acceleration plans. We are asking schools to lean on the reopening community core structure that we utilize to plan for term three, to plan for spring and summer acceleration efforts along with the 21-22 school year acceleration efforts. Those conversations should be happening now as LSATs are finalizing the budgets for next year and schools are planning for how they will utilize their supplemental funds that they have to plan for acceleration. Also a reminder, there's still opportunities for you to engage. We will have a round table on March 17th uh, we welcome you to join the conversation as we continue to dive deep into our recovery discussions. And then we will return for another town hall on March the 24th, to, again, to talk about our recovery and acceleration efforts. As we continue to move towards recentering on our students during this time period, reimagining how we can accelerate learning, but also address the social and emotional needs of our students as well. So thank you again um, for our team of teaching and learning with the highlights. We'll now turn it back over for questions and comments. All right, and now we're gonna move on to our Q&A portion of the program. Um, as a quick reminder, if you would like to ask a question, you can press zero now and you'll be added into our speaker queue. Or if you're joining via social media, you can comment your question on our Facebook and Twitter live streams using the hashtag DC Hope. Our first question is gonna to go to the phone lines. Um, Sherry in Ward 7, your line is unmuted. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sherry Freeman. I am in Ward 7. Before I get started, I'd like to thank um, Chancellor Faraby for um, helping me out with an issue this week. You will recall that I sent an email regarding a device issue that I was having at my grandson's school. And with the assistance of Superintendent Stinson, I think, um, it was worked out by the end of the day on Monday. So I really appreciate the help from the staff. Now to my question. I actually have two questions. One is um, I came in doing a, the call. I came to the call kind of late. Dr. Uh, Dr. Fairby was... Um, Speaking, so I don't know if this was already discussed, but is it likely that 100% of the students will not be in the classroom during this school term? Um, and the second question is, I'm not sure when the end of the school day, school year, has the date of the end of the school year, but is it likely that day will come sooner rather than later, meaning will school end earlier than it's already scheduled to end for the school term. Thank you, Sherry, for your question. Uh, grandparents are rocking during this time period and supporting uh, parents and grandchildren, so thank you. Uh, we are not planning to modify the calendar for this current school year, so we anticipate this school year will end 
on time at the scheduled date uh, in our calendar. Uh, we are asking uh, parents to begin to register for our summer opportunities in April. Uh, we will announce soon what the centralized programs will be and then schools will also announce their school-based programming for the summer as well and registration will open in April. Uh, summer programming will begin in July. Uh, some will extend into August depending upon the grade level. Uh, for current term, term three, which goes until spring break in April, we don't anticipate any changes in our in-person seat offerings beyond what we have now. However, uh, some schools will be considering expanding their in-person programming uh, depending upon the demand for their schools and that expanded in-person opportunities will begin in the fourth term, which starts on April 19th. Thank you, Chancellor. We have a question coming from social media. A parent is asking whether or not there are additional supports for parents to make sure that their kids are on track. Um, they said that they're uh, sometimes feeling overwhelmed with understanding and supporting their middle school child with their uh, coursework. Great question. I will turn to our teacher and the learning team uh, who could provide more context about how to support students at home, particularly our middle grade students. Sure, I can take that. Thank you. Um, I think that the, the most important place to begin in terms of providing support for your students is to, um, to reach out to the teachers. And I know in middle school it can be a little tricky because your student probably has multiple teachers, right? They're going to have an English, math, science, socialize, etc. And so um, I know that it may be possible to um, communicate with each of those teachers individually, but it can also be helpful to reach out to either a counselor, um, school administrator. Um, oftentimes our middle schools have an identified assistant principal for each grade. Um, all of our middle schools should have advisory programs, and so your student may have an advisor. So it's just important to find that individual that you can talk to at the school and find out a little bit more about what supports are offered at your particular school and to really share what concerns you have specifically so that you can try to work together to develop a plan. We do have reading intervention and math supports available. Um, a lot of them are online uh, learning programs that teachers may be leaning on. We also are encouraging um, teachers to use time, particularly on Wednesdays, for small group support or office hours. So these are some examples of, of what may be available um, within the different courses. But as I said, it's important to kind of have that close partnership with you. And so the best thing is to find um, someone in the school that you can speak to about the specifics that you're concerned about. Thank you. Um, so the next question comes from social media as well. We have someone asking, how are they able to join the Recovery Community Corps? Yeah, so each school has a Recovery uh, Community Corps and uh, the school leaders often reach out directly to uh, the school community uh, to support the planning. Uh, so I would suggest that if you're interested in supporting your school, uh, whether you be a parent, a guardian, or an interested community member, is to reach directly out to the principal uh, and express your interest and determine if there's uh, space available on those teams so you can provide insight and voice. Thank you, Chancellor. The next question is going to come from social media as well. Um, we have a parent wondering whether or not there is going to be park testing this year. Great question. We, we've gotten lots of interest most recently about park testing. I believe there's been uh, some uh, information out to the community about a recent request for a waiver for park testing by the Office of the State Superintendent of Education. Uh, we have not receive any indication at this point whether or not that waiver will be approved. However, it's important to note that there are still accountability measures for schools and LEAs across the district to ensure that we continue to monitor uh, academic performance. Uh, based on the preliminary plan from the Office of State Superintendent of Education, should we not administer PARC, uh, we will report to the Office of State Superintendent of Education of how students are performing on our district summative and formative assessments as a measure of progress. Thank you, Chancellor. 
We have another question coming from social media. A parent is asking or saying that uh, their high school student is really enjoying the virtual learning environment and is doing very well in this format. And they want to know whether or not um, some classes will stay virtual for high schoolers going into the next school year. Great question. Uh, it's something I think about as a DCPS parent of a high school student uh, where I've seen some progress. Uh, and. I've seen some of the benefits of the remote learning posture. Uh, the, the short answer is we've had previously uh, opportunities for students to take courses online via our Opportunity Academies and other uh, course offerings through higher ed institutions that we partner with. Uh, we haven't made a determination of whether or not that would be uh, school-based or centralized next year or whether or not uh, we will offer the full spectrum of courses. Uh, so we will uh, follow up with families as we know more about uh, the health conditions and then also what we can offer. One of the benefits, though, that we're excited about of the ability to offer courses remotely is we've seen students uh, take, take advantage of advanced course offerings such as AP courses or college credit uh, that can be earned throughout the school year uh, without the student actually being in a classroom. Uh, so we want to, to learn from those uh, gains that students have been able to, to realize through the posture that we're in now and potentially take those into the future. Uh, but we haven't made any determinations yet about how students will access online courses or remote courses for the 21-22 school year. Awesome. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, we have another question regarding uh, virtual um, the virtual environment. We have a, a, a parent asking, um, are there any um, educational events, activities, and things that they can do with their family after school and on the weekends? Sure. Um, one thing I would definitely highlight and recommend are our parent university and particularly our family cornerstones, which have been created by um, the family and public engagement team. So. I know the information for those are, are prominent and available on the DCPS website. Um, I know I, I am a parent of three DCPS students and we recently participated in one of the Family Cornerstone Live events, which was a um, sort of a dance and exercise activity um, and getting to know yourself and feel good about uh, yourself in terms of wellness and movement. So it was a great event and I definitely recommend uh, families check out these Family Cornerstone live events. So there are both live events and events that you can engage in on your own time on the, um, under the banner of Family Cornerstones on our DCPS website. Thank you. We have a question coming from online from a parent who wants to know if there's a plan um, to get each student who wants an in-person um, spot, whether or not there's a plan to get them back to school. Yes, so for the 21-22 school year, the expectation is that all students are, are in person. Uh, for the remainder of this school year, as I mentioned earlier, where there is a demand for more in-person learning opportunities or programming and demand exceeds current capacity. Uh, we are partnering with schools for principals to propose options in which they can expand their in-person programming to offer more seats to students. That will be finalized uh, throughout this month and we'll be able to share with families uh, what those offerings are and start to begin offering seats accordingly for term four which begins in April after spring break on April 19th. Thank you. Uh, lots of questions on social media regarding extracurriculars. Um, we have some folks asking whether or not there's a plan to bring back sports this year or next year. What is that gonna look like? Yeah, we'd like to bring back sports as quickly as we can. Uh, that is heavily dependent upon uh, determinations from DC Health on uh, the health and safety status of allowing such activities to occur. Uh, we're hopeful that we will be able to offer some element of spring sports sometime this spring. And we are currently also exploring options where we can extend uh, into the summer uh, for some activities for extracurriculars. So that includes sports, but that could be other extracurriculars that students 
uh, typically participate in throughout the school year. So uh, as I always remind the public, uh, you can help us by all doing your part with our health and safety protocols to ensure that uh, our conditions remain on a positive trajectory and we can open up activities to young people. Thank you. Um, it actually looks like we've gotten through all of our questions. So um, I'm gonna actually turn it over to the chancellor to close us out for the evening. Thank you again for all of the, the insightful questions tonight. Also again, want to reiterate my gratitude to the teaching and learning team. Uh, they've done a phenomenal job this school year in uh, helping modify our curriculum to support teachers in addressing both students in person and learning remotely. Uh, we've done some tremendous work over the summer last year in preparation for this school year. Uh, we will do the same over this summer. Uh, we're excited about uh, our work with uh, our racial equity team. We're excited about our cornerstones that were mentioned earlier. Uh, so families should expect DCPS to continue to make strides in those areas. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do know that there are schools where uh, there is family demand for in-person learning, where we're not able to accommodate uh, all of that demand at this point. And again, we're working with our principals to expand uh, as many uh, seats and offerings as we can as we go into term four in April. Uh, and again, I wanna thank our local school advisory team and our recovery community cores that are now in the planning phase for acceleration and recovery. Thank you again.